Good afternoon, my name is Lee Cobb. I'm a trustee with the Keel Conservancy. Today, I'm delighted to introduce you to Lauren Rust, who is the founder and executive director of the Low Country Marine Mammal Network. It's a local nonprofit whose mission is to protect local marine mammals through science, education, and conservation. Lauren received a BS in marine biology from the College of Charleston in 2004. This was followed by a master's in science in ecology from the University of Wales in the UK. Before founding the Low Country Marine Mammal Network in 2017, Lauren directed the research department at the Marine Mammal Center in California. There, she managed the necropsy lab, various research projects, and led the large whale recovery team. Lauren has also worked at NOAA, responding to sick and injured animals in South Carolina, and at the Environmental Specimen Bank here in Charleston, which is part of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. As you will see, Lauren is passionate about marine mammal research and education and hopes to bring a greater awareness of Charleston's local dolphin population to the Low Country. Thanks for joining us today, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. Hello, Kiowa. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Lauren Rust. I'm the founder and director of the Low Country Marine Mammal Network. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about our work and the dolphins in the Low Country and maybe how you can get involved. So our organization is about four years old. Our mission is to protect marine mammals through um, quality science, outreach, and conservation. We are located on the peninsula, but we do a lot of work on Kiowa and Seabrook Island, particularly around strand feeding dolphins. We are one of the very few uh, organizations that does outreach about marine mammals um, around Charleston. And we do that through um, you know, educational outreach with young kids and school groups. We do a lot of presentations, booths, uh, and um, dolphin monitoring. Um, so as you see, we try to out do a lot of outreach um, with the local community. We've been doing summer camps this year. Uh, we also do response, which is the picture on the bottom right. Uh, so we respond to any stranded marine mammal in South Carolina that washes up. We work closely with the South Carolina Marine Mammal Stranding Network. So if animals wash up, we will respond and um, give care as needed. Just to start, because most of our work really follows the Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, it's important to understand that it's illegal to touch animals, feed them, swim with, engage, or harass or disturb um, any marine mammals, whether it's from land or on the water. Um, what's really interesting is that we have a high diversity of species off of South Carolina. Uh, so this just shows um, you know, most of the animals that have either stranded or they pass through, um, you know, you have the resident dolphins here that are that are here, um, both a coastal population as well as resident animals, uh, pygmy sperm whales. These are only about eight, eight feet, but they hang out off of our coast. Um, and then you have animals like the right whale or a humpback whale that only pass our coast about twice a year when they're migrating. So they'll go by um, in the spring and they'll go back um, in the fall. But that's important because they hug the coastline so they can come very, very close to our coast. Um, you know, and there's always, you know, danger of, of getting hit by boats or things like that. And so these animals, um, we have seen all of these animals. We, all, we also occasionally have um, a seal or a porpoise, but they're usually coming down from the northeast. Um, and we're on the very, very southern end of their range. Um, but I'm going to focus a lot on the uh, Charleston bottlenose dolphins. That's what most people see. It's most interesting. And they're local dolphins. Um, so just really exciting. So we have about three to 400 long-term resident dolphins, meaning they are born and bred here. They do not migrate. They don't, um, you know, go offshore very far. You will see them if you're out at the beach. Um, they may use, you know, kind of the very tight coast to, um, to go from one river to the next, or they might go out to feed, um, but they're, they're going to spend about 90% of their time in the rivers. So our rivers are brackish, meaning it's a good mix of salt and fresh water, and they're actually on the salty side. And so it's a great habitat for these animals to thrive. There's also really great food, and there's not really any predators. 
Um, so they live here year round, which is amazing for us because they live um, into their 40s. So if you're seeing these animals and they often stick kind of to a, a waterway, so for the Kiowa River, for example, you're seeing the same set of animals year after year after year, which is just really amazing. Um, so they also care for their young. They have a um, very high um, investment in their young. So they keep their young for two to three to even up to six years, teaching them how to feed, protecting them, teaching them how to strand feed if mom is a strand feeder, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, they're opportunistic feeders, so they feed on shrimp, crabs, um, mullet we know is important, squid. And then I'll talk a little bit more about strand feeding, but that is a very unique feeding behavior um, to our local Charleston dolphins, and it is passed down from mother to calf. So this is just an interesting picture from um, a uh, scientific paper, but this just shows these red dots or brown dots are our resident dolphin um, sightings. And so as you can see, they're really using the river system extensively. Um, the blue dots are coastal dolphins or migratory dolphins. So animals that live, they don't really come into the rivers. There's a couple blue dots in here, but they're mostly staying out on the coast and they could be migrating even from the northeast to, the, to even south of us. Um, or even pelagic dolphins, so animals that are really far um, offshore and that you typically live in very deep water. So you can see there's a big difference here and, and the extent that, that these um, local resident dolphins use the river system. So this is just a great example. This is a dolphin named Step. She has been monitored um, by an, another research group um, called the National Marine Mammal Foundation since 1995 here in Charleston. I see her um, on a, on a very regular, maybe a weekly basis down at Captain Sam's. So she's still alive and kicking and she's very active. Um, but during the, the other group, their research, they had spotted her all these black dots about over 70 times in the Stono River. So that is, she's considered a Stono River resident. She spends most of her time there. That is gonna be her home range. You might have a Cooper River resident, Ashley River resident. But Step hangs out in the Cooper River or the Stono River, and through some of our work down at Captain Sam's, we spotted her there, and that was the first time they had um, a, a sighting of her down at, at, Cap, at the, in the Kiowa River. So very exciting information, um, and she's over 27 years old. She's been seen with at least five calves. We now know that she's a strand feeder from our work down at the, the inlet. Um, and again, that was the first time that they had spotted her there. And she definitely plays a matriarchal role. She, um, like I said, she's older, she's had a number of calves, and she definitely seems to kind of watch over. She babysits the current calf in that group. Um, and so she's just a lot of fun to see. She's very obvious because of this step, if you will. Um, this is an old injury, um, and that's where she gets her name. Also through some of our work, because these animals, again, live here and they're very easy to study, um, this is some of the information that we get through photo ID. So we take images of these dorsal fins, that's how we identify them, and then we can find out some of these associations. So this is mom step, this is Rosie, her 11-year-old calf, and this is high scoops, her 17-year-old calf. Um, I should say offspring now, they're no longer calves, they're totally independent from mom. They also spend a, um, a lot of time in the Stono River but we do see them come into the inlet together and have an association. So a long-term association between mom and her offspring. So this is an image I caught of step and high scoop, so her, um, her calf. And then this is Rosie and high scoops hanging out together, so siblings. So again, we see them independent from one another, but interesting to see them come together um, you know, over time and still strand feed together. And as I talked about, strand feeding is passed down from mother to calf. So very interesting just to see them come back together to strand feed together. This is at the inlet um, and probably a spot where high scoops learned how to strand feed from its mother step. So this is some of the data that we collect. All of our information goes into a national database um, and it's kept tracked every time we see an animal that sighting is recorded and we keep they keep track of, you know, the animal that where it was, who it was with, if it has a new calf, um, who's hanging out with who, who's a strand feeder, who's not a strand feeder, information like that, which helps us understand the population as a whole.
Um, so talking a little bit more, you guys are probably very familiar with strand feeding because it happens right in your backyard. You are super lucky. Um, it is this unique feeding behavior. We believe that happened because these animals live in the rivers their, their whole life. They just adapted to feeding in very narrow spaces, very shallow water. And ultimately what they're doing is just pushing fish, you know, trapping them up against a sandbank, a dock, a mud flat, um, and then just giving that last little push um, to catch them when they push them ashore. So basically what they're doing is corralling the fish close to a bank, um, which is just, you know, getting them close together and the dolphins are surrounding them. And by beaching themselves, it creates a wave that pushes those fish ashore. The dolphins strand themselves, grab the fish, and then get back into the water. They're typically strand feeding on mullet. Uh, it does occur year round. Um, it slows down significantly in the winter time when there's just less food. Um, and the dolphins, they don't migrate. And so during the fall, they'll just fatten up to deal with less food. They also fatten up so they have a, a thicker blubber layer to deal with the colder water temperatures. But some animals do strand feed throughout the year. Um, and strand feeding is passed on from mother um, to calf. Uh, this is just some of the interesting data that we've collected through our education program at this bit. So these are 11 animals that we've identified as strand feeders at the inlet. Um, I will say strand feeding does occur um, all over Charleston. So there's other dolphins that use just different areas. But this is the ones we've identified at the spit. I should say strand feeding. Um, so South Carolina and Georgia are the only two places on the Atlantic coast that strand feeding occurs. So it's very, very rare and especially more rare because it's only passed down from mother to calf. So as an older animal, you, will, you won't learn it from your peers. And if you're one of those coastal dolphins coming in to feed, uh, you're not going to learn to do it either. It only comes from your mother. And so out of three, 350 dolphins, resident dolphins, we're not 100% sure, but we think there's only about 100 strand feeders. Um, and so again, not all dolphins are strand feeding. It's very, very unique. So you're, it's, you're super lucky to have this in your in your backyard. So one of our programs that we do, and you may be familiar with, is our Kiowa and Seabrook Island Dolphin Education Program. So we've just wrapped up our fourth summer on Kiowa and our third on Seabrook. And because it's so rare and amazing to see, it really does need protection. And so because it's so accessible um, on Kiowa and Seabrook Islands to see, um, as you know, it's, it's definitely become a big attraction. Um, and with more people and visitors coming, especially people that may not be familiar with strand feeding and, and what to do if they see the dolphins, there has been an increase in human interactions. So things like people getting really too close to take pictures, but we've also seen people, um, you know, wanting to throw things at the animals, jump in to swim with them, jump in to touch them, um, throw cast nets towards them to catch their fish. And that's very, very uh, disruptive and stressful to the dolphins. So this, you know, they are not doing this for our entertainment. This is a huge feeding source for them. And so anytime that they're disrupted or um, spooked, maybe, they're, they're most likely to just swim off, abandon their feeding effort. Sometimes they leave the inlet altogether. Sometimes they'll, you know, find another spot, maybe up the river or across the other side. And that can be very stressful time and time again if you think about thousands of people down there um, every time they're getting spooked they're not getting their meal and if you know they're not feeding that can just cause if they're already maybe sick or they're pregnant and they need to feed that kind of continual or chronic um, stress can cause things like reproductive failure or illness or if they're already ill maybe it tips them over you know to to death and then things like mother teaching their calf, if she doesn't feel it's a safe place to teach her your, her young calf, then maybe she doesn't teach the young calf. So that's the next generation of strand feeders. Or say she decides to teach her calf maybe in a safer spot down the river um, out of the public's eye. And so, you know, that would be a loss of us to us that we couldn't go down maybe the next, you know, in a few years and see the little one strand feeding at, at the inlet. So it's very, very important um, to, to kind of reduce those interactions. So our educator program places educators on the beach almost seven days a week um, during times for about four hours a day during the times when the dolphins are most likely to feed and when the most visitors are there. Um, our educators are equipped with a ton of really awesome information 
They're always happy to answer questions, point out individual dolphins, talk about strand feeding, talk to kids and answer questions. And then ultimately kind of, you know, encourage, you know, uh, visitors to give the dolphins a little bit of space. So we ask you to stand back about 45 feet uh, just so the dolphins again can feed without feeling, you know, nervous or stressed because the dolphins are very, very aware of you. They will often kind of eyeball you, sometimes stick their heads up. And they're really making sure the coast is clear before they strand feed because they're very vulnerable when their body comes out onto the beach of getting touched or stuck or, or things like that. And so by giving them lots and lots of space, you are more likely to see all the strand feeding because they will feel safe and they will continue to do it. Um, and they you know, won't find a, a different quieter spot. And so um, that's what our educators do. We've, last year we talked to over 4,000 visitors at, um, just on Kiowa, total about 6,000 visitors on both sides of the inlet. So a significant amount of people are coming down there to see it. And um, again, our main thing is just to provide education and to give the dolphins lots of space to feed. Um, so this is just an image. This is uh, Coco and Kai. They are very well known, a mother calf pair. Um, little Kai back here is two and a half years old now. We've been monitoring it since it was born. And it's watching its mother. This is its mother. She strand feeds a lot by herself, sometimes with a group. But such an interesting behavior to watch this little one really stay close to mom and watch her strand feed. And over the last year, we've been watching Kai, you know, practicing hydroplaning so just kind of cruising the the coast without actually beaching itself feeding practicing with mom and then really watching the groups um, strand feed so when there's four or five six animals strand feeding kai will be right here just off the side kind of watching what's going on so we're just really excited to watch um, this little one you know start to pick it up um, again, as I mentioned, here are some of the negative behaviors we see. So this individual was grabbing the, the fish while the dolphins were strand feeding and then teasing the dolphin with it. So these are the behaviors that we want to intercept. Um, you know, we're not out there to, to, to yell at anybody or to, you know, monitor anything other than just trying to intercept things like this so that the dolphins can feed in uh, peace. So one other thing that we do, which is really important, is um, strandings. So different than strand feeding, a stranding is an animal that washes up onto the beach because it's ill, it's injured, it's sick, or maybe it's already deceased. Um, one thing we have to mention is that when you ever, if you ever come across an animal like this, it's very important you do not push it back into the water. Marine mammals are adapted to living in the ocean and the water. So if they've beached themselves, there's a reason for it. They, they're either you know too weak and, and sick and they and they get pushed in with the currents. Maybe they've already died. Uh, maybe they just got really disoriented or maybe they're entangled. So by pushing them back, you know, can sometimes prolong their suffering. Um, if they are injured and they can't swim, they're more likely to probably just restrand maybe a couple hours later, maybe the next day. And so the best thing to do is to call this hotline down here, this number. This is our 24 hour monitored wildlife hotline. Um, so call that and we'll have a team out there um, very quickly or we'll maybe walk you through some steps you can do in the meantime. And then we'll come and assess the animal and determine what needs to be done. But this is the safest. We have vets on staff. And so it's, it's great to get, you know, somebody trained up to, to come and assess these animals. Sometimes we do push the animals back. It just depends on the case and the species and the situation. Um, and then what we what we do if the animal is deceased, we will take the back. We have a lab on, uh, we work with on James Island and the, the animal will do a complete. Um, it's called a necropsy, which is an animal autopsy. And we'll basically open the animal up, look for a cause of death, um, but then also look for things like human impacts or contaminant loads, um, diet analysis. How old was the animal? Had it reproduced? Does it have calves? Um, things like that, which really helps us understand the population. So how healthy are the animals? What's their contaminant load? What are they eating? How old are these animals? Are there other diseases that we should be worried about or monitoring? Um, dolphins are really top predators. And so understanding why these animals are dying can help us understand ocean health and ultimately human health because we share both a diet and a habitat with them. So some of the other conservation issues these um, animals face, 
Um, you know, we, we have to bring this up because it's very easy to see dolphins out there and, and they look like they're smiling and they're playful and they're happy. And it just, it's easy to think that they're just doing great and, you know, they're fine out there and nobody needs to care about them. Um, but they do face a lot of issues and, you know, by through the monitoring or through these necropsies helps us understand why these animals are dying and helps us, you know, decide, create management decisions. Um, so things like boat strikes here an animal, um, you know, these animals are in in waterways where there's a lot of people and a lot of boats and there's and there's going to be interactions. Um, this animal was hooked. So things like um, entanglements or, you know, begging from boats, uh, feeding or um, begging. Yeah, which can lead to entanglements. Marine debris. So this animal just um, died. It choked on tinfoil. So just trash in the water system. Um, this animal is not a species we have here, but it's trapped in nets. Um, just identifies, you know, problems of, you know, if there's animals getting caught in fishing nets, how do we, you know, mitigate that? Um, you know, crab pot, long lines, things like that. So understanding when this can happen. Um, things like seismic drilling. Um, so not only the noise pollution, but also the risk of oil spills, uh, you know, boat traffic, boat noise, things like that, dredging in the harbor. So that can affect these animals. Obviously they can move, they're quick moving, but they do have these small habitats. And so, um, you know, by understanding when, you know, these drilling or these things happen in an animal, maybe in a habitat where these animals give birth and they care for their young in a small river, you know, if you start to dredge there, I mean, that's definitely going to disrupt um, some of those behaviors. So we need to understand that. Um, and then this animal, although a sea lion, which we don't have here, he's suffering from something called domoic acid or shellfish poisoning, which we all can get. Um, shellfish poisoning is kind of the human term from eating basically um, seafood that's been affected by like a red tide. So red tide is a naturally occurring, um, uh, th you know, in the ocean and algae in the ocean. Um, and, you know, occasionally it, it ramps up, it comes in, it affects fish, um, oysters, mussels, um, and then, you know, animals like this, dolphins or sea lions, eat it in a fatal amount and can cause um, a really bad illness, and humans can too. And the point of this is that these guys are, you know, really sentinel species, so dolphins as well. Um, and so if we start getting a large number of animals coming in, dolphins coming in that are sick and, and we test and we think that they're sick with something that's called domoic acid, we would then tell the, the fisheries and say, hey, this is going on. We need to close down the fisheries so that humans don't start getting shellfish poisoning. So they're the first indicators of how healthy our oceans are and the seafood that we're eating out, out of the ocean. So some recommendations, um, a lot of these come from the NOAA um, and then we just abide by them, but keeping a distance. So if you ever see dolphins out in the wild, um, they suggest 50 yards in a watercraft, and this is a kayak um, or paddleboard included. And then we suggest 45, uh, sorry, 15 yards or 45 feet from, from land. Um, and again, obviously dolphins are always moving and this can sometimes be you know, hard to do. The idea behind it is if you see a dolphin, they just don't want you going right directly on top of it and, and trying to see it or chase it because you want to get a, a picture or touch it. Um, just give them a little bit of space Never engage with dolphins if they approach. We do have issues with people hand feeding dolphins in Charleston, which creates this begging behavior. Begging behavior, you know, is usually a dolphin coming up to another boat, um, sometimes with its head up, kind of like a begging dog, uh, looking for a treat and a handout, a fish. Um, and people give all sorts of food, whether it is, you know, old dead bait or Cheerios or Doritos, um, which really isn't good for dolphins. It also creates this begging behavior, which then brings them closer to boats. They will bring their young closer to boats. Um, it's a learned behavior. And then they're often the ones getting hit by boats or entangled in fishing gear or getting caught in fishing nets, things like that. We want these animals to be as wild as possible. So if you do have a begging dolphin that does approach your boat, um, ignore it. Don't pay it any attention. Don't interact with it, such as like splashing the water or trying to touch it. Um, cut the engine if you can. Um, if dolphins are close by, it just reduces the risk of hitting one. Um, never wanting to chase, circle, follow behind. Again, if you're in a boat, watercraft, especially in the inlet, which is really small and narrow, and these animals are moving and feeding. Um, you know, kayaks are very quiet. 
um, or you know if your boat is is off and so never wanting to chase them around or feel like they're trapped you know up to the bank or a dock try to discard bait or release fish discreetly away from dolphins if they are there begging ignore, ignore begging dolphins and then please report distressed or stranded dolphins to that hotline so why is this important we in charleston are so lucky to have a resident population of dolphins there are very few resident uh, populations like this and there's only 350 of them so think about if there was only 350 you know rare white tigers somewhere you know we'd want to protect them and and keep them safe and and keep them away from you know bothering them or hurting them and we have to treat these dolphins the same um, they have a lot of you know risks such as um, you know, just natural illnesses that they're dealing with, human interactions, boat strikes, loss of food, predators, things like that. And so human interaction is something that we can control and try to reduce. They're also top predators, so they're super important for the ecosystem. If we lose a dolphin population, there will be a trickle-down effect between fish that we eat, oysters that we all love. Um, you know, the list goes on, shrimp populations. We cannot lose these top predators. It'll throw the ecosystem off. Again, as I mentioned, they're also um, sentinel or indicator species. So we want dolphins around so that we know that the, that the water might be, you know, is healthy. We don't have all these animals dying from something. They're also just really important to the community. It is a joy to go see them. I've never met somebody that didn't love to see a dolphin. I know in Keough and Seabrook Island is a highlight um, to take people down to see the dolphin strand feeding. Um, there's tours. You can go kayak and see them. So what a loss to the community it would be if these animals, um, if something happened to these animals, and again, the ecosystem. I should also mention, because these are resident dolphins, if something happened, such as an oil spill or just a natural disease, and a, a loss, this population was lost, or a big chunk of the population was lost, it would take a very, very long time for them to repopulate. One, they don't start to give birth until they're about 14 years old. And they only give have one calf every two to three to five years. So that's going to take a long time. And you're not going to have offshore or coastal dolphins kind of come in and fill up this population. So if we lost this population, there's a risk that it would just be gone or take a really long time to repopulate. As I mentioned, feeding wild dolphins disrupts their, their wild instincts. They end up becoming beggars. Um, and begging dolphins, as I mentioned, can they all teach their young and they're at a higher risk of getting injured. And then harassment or disturbance is very stressful to the animals, especially at places like the spit where they see thousands of people each day. So if we all you know, can keep our distance and give the dolphins lots of space, they're more likely to, to just keep doing what they're doing. Why I think you should care, dolphins are charismatic. Everybody loves dolphins. They're so important to the population. Um, as I mentioned, they're you know, just sentinel species for ocean and human health that we share. We also share diseases um, and we, we eat a lot of the same food that they eat. Increased human threats, loss of habitat um, can alter marine mammals behaviors. There have been studies in other places that dolphins will alter their behavior or their feeding locations due to human stressors. And so we'd hate to have these animals leave the spit because it's too you know, too dangerous or they're constantly getting um, disturbed that they choose to just feed down the Kiowa River somewhere that we can't see them. And hopefully you can continue to bring your kids and your grandkids and your friends there for generations to come. And a loss of population would just be a huge loss to all of the Charleston community. So ways you can help, please always report a stranded and distressed animal to this hotline. Um, if you forget this number, always call Beach Patrol um, or the DNR and they will get in touch with us. For more information, please visit our website. We're always looking for volunteers. Um, follow us on social media if you just want to keep up with Kai and Coco or other animals like Step. And then please spread the word about um, our organization and the work that we do. We're so thankful. Thank you guys for having us and we'll see you soon. First of all, I love your presentation. I, I feel like I've learned so much more about dolphins because of you. Um, but um, one question I have is you could have focused on other areas, but you came to Charleston. Um, why did you create this educational program for Kiowa and Seabrook? Well, uh, I mean, Charleston is just really fortunate enough to have a local population of dolphins. Um, not a lot of places 
have resident dolphins. You know, we have extensive water system, great food, uh, and these animals just, you know, they don't leave. They're born and bred here. So that's unique in that they're a great population of animals to study. Um, they also need, you know, a lot of protection because they aren't, you know, traveling in huge areas. And so, you know, their risk can sometimes be greater because they're very specific. Um, you know, they are dealing with human interactions, you know, boat traffic, potential food loss, disturbance, things like that. Um, and because, because they are here their whole life, maybe 40 years, um, you know, I feel like we can make a difference because it is individual dolphins in a very small area um, and it's so localized that by working with the community and providing education, um, I do think we can actually, you know, make a difference versus just offshore dolphins, which we can make a difference. You know, lots of people are doing great things for um, pelagic species, but because we can talk to the community that are, you know, can see these animals in their backyard, there's a you know really close correlation, and so that was really important to me. That's great. Well, thank you. Um, do you know how long dolphins have been strand feeding in in both South Carolina and and Georgia? We don't. I mean, the the earliest record I've been able to find is in the '70s, um, but I suspect they've been doing it for you know much longer than that. Um, you know, unfortunately, we just don't have any, you know, records dating back um, further than that. But, you know, I think this is a behavior that they've adapted to by living in these rivers. And so, you know, I suspect it's been a long time. We know marine mammals have been living in, you know, Charleston through, you know, when historical and, um, you know, records. And so, you know, I, I think it's, I'm sure it's been going on for, you know, decades, century. I don't, you know, I just can't say specifically, but I think as long as as long as we know, they've probably been doing it. That's great. So, have you um, seen any changes um, in either human behavior or, or or dolphin behavior since you started your education program? So, you know, I think from what I've seen and from what people have told me, and and again, we only monitor strand feeding really at Captain Sam's. We know that they strand feed all over Charleston. Some areas are, you know, sort of public. Most areas are in small creeks, rivers. So, you know, you're lucky enough if you maybe live, you know, on a dock or if you're kayaking or have a boat, which is great for the dolphins' privacy. Um, so we, I can only speak for really Captain Sam's, but from talking to people uh, and from just the last four years out there, I mean, there's definitely been an increase in popularity and, and you know, wanting to see it. It's definitely a local attraction. For good cause it is amazing to see and it's one of the few places you can see it in the world so we understand why people want to come down there but just with increased you know um people you know there's always just a risk of increased um interactions so some uh, intentional and uh, most of it's unintentional you know just you know getting really close and wanting to observe and things like that so that you know can definitely cause um you know disturbance and stress to the dolphins um, so I think that's the main thing we, you know, we've heard that, you know, some years it's busier, some years it's slower with dolphins, um, things like changing the inlet, you know, and I think that's going to just fluctuate, you know, a lot of the biggest driver is food. So, um, and I think human disturbance can, can play, it's definitely going to play a role in that, but, you know, they're there to feed on the mullet. And so, you know, there's definitely better years, uh, you know, fish populations are better some years whether it's, you know, we had a cold snap or, you know, lots of things play into that too. And so I think, you know, you're going to have some great years and some, you know, slower years. Um, but I think the increase in just um, people and visitors coming down um, has been the biggest change that I've seen, even in four years. And I, you know, I think with just national attention, it's, it's only going to increase. And so we, you know, hope to continue just creating awareness and education just to protect the dolphins. Well, thank you. Um, do you know how many um, dolphins of reproductive age there are currently in the Captain Sam Spit? So, you know, we suspect there's about 25 dolphins that um, kind of use the Kiowa River as maybe their main home range. There's dolphins that we know come down from the Stono River, um, you know, to come into the Kiowa River and, and use the inlet. 
Um, but focusing on the inlet, you know, we have a, we see about the same six or seven dolphins very consistently. Um, and through some genetic work um, that was done, you know, through the National Ocean Service, the National Marine Mammal Foundation, um, we can confirm there's a number of males and part of that six to seven group. Um, there's definitely, I think, two confirmed males for genetics. And there's another one or two that are kind of probable males, um, mainly because males typically hang out with males. So, you know, we have a couple animals that hang out with the confirmed males, and so they're, you know, suspect males, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, we know there's a reproducing female that has a current calf, so we refer to them as Coco and Kai. So um, she has a two, two and a half year old calf, uh, and she won't have another calf until that little one's independent, which could be, you know, around three or four or so. Uh, there's an older female uh, who we know is, you know, greater than 28 years old. Uh, she hasn't had a calf in the last four years. Um, she's had five calves in the past. She has not had a calf in the last four years. So she could be maybe, you know, too old to have another calf or for, for other reasons. So I'm not sure she'll reproduce again. Um, and that's, and then there's a couple others that are still like undetermined. We don't exactly know their gender or their age. So we see them frequently, but they've not had a long history um, with, the, with other researchers that you know, some of these long-term ages, you know, this female that's 28, they've been documenting her since 1995. And so they have a long history. So they know approximately, you know, how old she could be. And um, so there's some animals that, you know, just obviously get missed. And so we don't know the ages on all of them. So there could still be a few that are maybe just reaching sexual maturity and, and could, or they could be males. Um, but right now, in the last four years, we've only had one reproducing female, um, and she's going to be the only one to pass it on, this behavior to her calf, because it's a learned behavior from mother to calf. We, I can say there has been other calves in the Kiowa River. We do get reports of that, um, but either they're not strand feeders. So again, if your mom's not a strand feeder, she's not going to teach it, or they're strand feeding at just a different location, and they don't use the inlet as their spot. and so. Um, but we do know there were other calves this past spring and so um but at the inlet specifically we've only had um the one breeding female mm -hmm. oh, thank you thank you now we heard a little bit about um some special guests filming in the inlet this fall can you tell us a little bit about about that and what they're doing and yeah I, I can give you um a little bit of detail because it is a little bit um top secret but, um, you know, wildlife, uh, two wildlife, um, you know, major companies came to document strand feeding for a wildlife series, um, which obviously we will share when it's, when it airs. But, uh, you know, I think it's just important, you know, working with them, we consulted with them when, you know, making sure obviously everything was done safely. And then, you know, obviously being able to point out individual animals but I think it's just important for you know all of us to realize that these companies want to come to Kiowa because this this behavior is so amazing. You know, it's it, again, you know, they're not. It, this is one of the few places that it can really be, be documented and it's so um, available to see. And so you know, they came because strand, one strand feeding is just this amazing, unique behavior, and that you know, it's it's so close and and. You know able to see on on your beaches um and so they were documenting you know strand feeding and kind of the learning behavior and things like that and so um we are super excited to um to have been able to help with it and then to share it with you guys when it when it um, airs well we're looking forward to seeing it thank you thank yeah. you um can you can you tell us a, a little bit more about your volunteers for kiowa and seabrook program and and training schedule and how people can get involved. Sure. So I just want to start with, you know, this education program started about four years ago and, and it really started because there, you know, was this increase in, in people wanting to come see it. And, and so um, working with NOAA Fisheries, uh, you know, they determined that, you know, we should try to have people out there monitoring to see what's going on, how many dolphins are out there, how often is strand feeding happening, how many people are coming. And then we've been fortunate to have been uh, funded through uh, both the town of Seabrook and the town of Kiowa to run this more consistent education program. So we have about 30 volunteers um, 
combined on both both sides with about 16 Kiowa volunteers. And, and so, you know, they go through a training where they learn everything about dolphins and strand feeding. So they're, you know, equipped to answer questions, um, point out individual dolphins. You know, we talk to people, you know, about everything and we answer, you know, lots of questions. But um, so they're out there mainly to kind of provide education, you know, tell people what they're going to see, um, encourage people to just hang back a little bit. So we do post signs. Um, with some of these recommendations, uh, you know, to, to stand back and to keep voices down, um, to not, you know, interact with the animals. Um, and then we collect data on the, on the dolphins, you know, how many are there, and that's how we know these individuals, how often they're strand feeding, who's hanging out with who, who might have a new calf. And, you know, that helps us, it, one, that information goes into a national database. So there's a national dolphin database, so we keep track of, you know, dolphins that are still alive, their relationships, uh, their new, you know, their calves and, and things like that. Um, but then uh, that information also helps us and the towns to understand, you know, how unique this is, how many dolphins are feeding there, when is it happening, how often, um, and it helps us, you know, understand our programming too. How many volunteers do we need? What days are busy or what times of years? Um, you know, so we can, you know, have more volunteers maybe on the weekends or holidays, for example. And then we, you know, we know things like strand feeding occurs all year long, um, you know, in which dolphins do it more than others, for example. Um, I can tell you, you know, which dolphins are going to strand feed with which other dolphin. Um, you know, there's some alliances there, for example. Um, you know, I can tell you the mom strand feeds alone all the time. And that's really a lot of information that people didn't know before. Strand feeding is not well studied. And so we are just collecting a lot of amazing data because it's, it's such a great study site. There's just the dolphins are there, you know, almost every day, year round, year after year. We've seen the same few dolphins now for four years. And so we're also, you know, hoping to uh, publish some of that data and, and, you know, make it available, um, you know, for, you know, the world to see, because there are other sites, strand feeding sites to share that information. Um, and just, you know, and so the, anyway, the volunteers are out there um, about four hours a day. Um, we try to be out there, you know, most days, at least through um, kind of the high season. And again, we post the signs, we're, we're walking around, talking to the public, answering questions. Um, they're really a wealth of information. So I would, you know, encourage you to, you know, approach and ask any questions. Um, they'll point, point dolphins out to you, which is really fun to be able to say, hey, this is Step, you know, she's 30 years old, or this is the mom and calf. It just makes your experience so much greater. Um, and so it's, it's been really fun. I think the volunteers uh, have, a, have a really good time doing it. Well, thank you. Sounds like it. I've, I've seen some of those volunteers and they certainly are knowledgeable. So it's, it's a great resource and we thank you for providing it. Of course. Are there any other messages you'd like to get out to folks? We will post your your number for those who might want to get involved. Yeah, I was going to yeah, follow up with that. We are um, always looking for more volunteers. Um, you know, volunteers are only committed to two shifts a month. So it's not a huge commitment. And um, so please, you know, get involved. If you want to learn more, you know, visit our website, shoot us an email. Um, and then, you know, I think just in general, I think, you know, I think everyone knows how special strand feeding is. But, you know, just encouraging everybody to, you know, share that with your friends and, you know, visitors and anyone you take down there and, and just give them lots of space to feed undisturbed. We can tell you from experience, they are more likely to feed and to, you know, put on a show when they, when they don't feel stressed out and they don't feel kind of bombarded by people. So we need the community to help us spread that word. Um, you know, it's hard when we're out there by ourselves and we can only reach so many people. So definitely encourage you to, you know, tell your friends and your neighbors and, and, and speak up when you're down there and, and help us all, I think, protect. It's so amazing. And I think you guys are so lucky that it's, you know, it's, it's in your backyard. And so um, really just want to make a community effort to protect it. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your information and for all the work you and your staff are doing. Um, Thank you. Well, I'll see you down on the spit. I'm yeah, sure. exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Lauren.
Thank you for joining us today. Please visit our website at kiowaconservancy.org or our YouTube channel to learn about other presentations and activities. Take care. Thank you.